this podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them, um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get midwinter. Let's get started. There are people who are still going to jump in, but just uh, for everyone watching, um, there's a chat section, so you can click on the chat and just make sure you um, click to everyone so everyone can see. And throughout the interview, feel free to just throw out questions uh, for Ian, um, and we'll get to that towards the end. We'll do a, a Q and A session. Um, so uh, we. I don't know if anyone else can see Ian and and is getting thick by him moving around his computer, <laughs> but I am. It's the room, straight box up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone else can see that. So, um, just a quick update. We're super excited. The XY Advisor team got together in Sydney uh, last Friday and Saturday, working through the weekend, um, and we're just planning what we're doing over the next twelve months. And we've got some really exciting stuff coming out. Um, and we're excited to tell you, and I was pushing the guys to so we could talk about it today, but they've put the brakes on and said, hold up, let's make sure we get it good before we can kind of um, start pumping it out there. Uh, so we'll hear more about it over the, ne over the coming month. Um, and we're just really excited because what we're doing uh, at XY Advisor is we're just building a community for advisors uh, to seek, share, and discuss valuable information that concerns the industry and concerns you as as an advisor um, or, or in the advice community. Uh, and really the aim is uh, to uh, help shape the future of the profession um, so we can provide really outstanding uh, outcomes for our clients. Um, so that's really what we're all about and we're kind of trying to do that better over the next 12 months and we will do it better over the next 12 months. And to kind of start off our interview, we've got Ian Dunbar, uh, I know plenty of people are really excited to hear about what you've got to talk about. Uh, and we're going to talk about fintech, what's happening in the Australian fintech space and how we as advice businesses can either get on board or, or adapt to, to what's going on. So thanks for joining us, Ian. Ah, cool. Not a problem. Very pleased to be here. So just to start off, can you give us a, um, a, a good overview of uh, the Australian fintech space uh, what's going on and how it relates to financial advice? Yeah, sure thing. So <clears throat> I think probably the first place I would start is the Australian fintech space is really, really active. Um, so it's now coming up, I reckon it's about 18 months since I first really got involved at the ground level with the Australian fintech community. Um, and I can remember, you know, at the time, we were probably counting 30 or 40 fintech innovators. Um, now, now there would be well and truly over probably 300 across Australia. Um, you know, even if you look in stone and chalk, um, here in Sydney, there's something like 70 fintech companies just, uh, you know, in, in um, stone and chalk alone. Um, <clears throat> I think that the in the space that's really relevant to financial advice, um, I really see probably a couple of really important trends. So the first one is we've been through the first wave of um, robo advice launch, um, which you know people I'm sure you know, have all heard so much about. It's never, never not in the press these days. Um, so, you know, again, if you go back to the beginning of last year, the very first kind of Australian robo-advice providers have been launched with StopSpot. Um, that number grew really quickly last year, this year. Um, some of the robo-advice providers have now vanished. Um, but I think that the main thing is you're starting to see a really rapid maturing of that part of the, um, that part of the industry starting to become very focused on B2B as, as distinct from direct to consumer. Um, so you've got providers out there like um, Ignition Wealth, for example, who've got very much a, a B2B strategy. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the, the more major players 
start to deliver kind of robo-like technology as well. Um, Midwinter, for example, doing a lot around the digital advice space. Um, so really rapid maturing of that space. Um, the second area that I'd touch on is um, the growing use of data aggregation. So a number of people I'm sure are probably familiar with the likes of Yodli or, um, or EYs. Um, and that, you know, these are the technologies that enable us to um, do that scary concept of a thing called give the, give, give the um, provider our usernames and passwords to our various financial services accounts, goes away, grabs the data, aggregates it, builds a balance sheet, builds a, um, you know, expenditure patterns, builds your sort of personal financial planning profile. Um, again, that's now been in Australia for a couple of years. You've got the likes of My Prosperity, you've got Money Brilliant, you've got Money Soft, Pocketbook, etc. That space is really maturing quickly as well. Um, and what's really important there is it's not the aggregation of the information itself, it's what the um, fintech providers can start doing with it. So how they actually start using that data to provide really smart um, information, both for advisors and also for consumers. Mm. I that's good stuff. I, it was remiss of me to uh, not actually introduce you. Um, some people may not know who the, the great famous Ian Dunbar is and what you're talking about, FinTech. Um, so, uh, Ian, you're the CEO of Sweetbox and you founded Affiniation. Uh, so, just give us a quick snippet about what those two are, just in case uh, people yeah, sure. don't know what they are. <laughs> and that was easily the most overstated introduction I've ever heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> not very famous Ian Dunbar. Um, <laughs> so, so two things. So, so Sweetbox, um, Sweetbox is um, a New Zealand-based tech company that um, I took over as CEO of earlier this year. I'm, I'm not the founder, but I am one of the major shareholders and now CEO. And Sweetbox is all about delivering a, a video-based engagement channel um, between um, professionals that so could be advisors, mortgage brokers, accountants, etc., to their clients, um, and really importantly, to create the distinction. For example, with Zoom that we're on at the moment, um, Sweetbox is all about bringing other capabilities into that, you know, online meeting space, such as being able to edit and manage documents, digitally sign documents, um, have document documents witnessed very shortly. Um, all about creating that kind of fully digital transaction process. Affiniation, which no one can ever pronounce because we made the name up, um, is um, was a, a network of fintech um, uh, providers in Australasia that um, I set up at the beginning of last year. Um, and it was all prom prompted from the fact that at the time, Really, we had so much focus and so much attention on fintech that was coming out of the US. Um, you know, people would talk all the time about Wealthfront and Betterment and whatever it might be. Uh, and in Australia and New Zealand, we didn't really promote or talk about the companies that were in our own backyard. Mm. So we, we created Affiniation really as a, um, as a kind of communications and marketing and events um, entity to help promote Australian and New Zealand fintech. If I'm honest, the market has moved so fast that there is so much promotion of Australian and New Zealand fintech now. I think we almost have made ourselves redundant out of the, out of the job there. Um, but yeah, so that's the background. Yeah, no, fantastic. Uh, so my next question is, uh, there's plenty of fintech stuff coming out uh, in, in the US and also in Australia. So uh, as advisors or an advice business, um, what are the clear ways we can evaluate each fintech startup and, and how we can maybe use it in our business? Yeah, cool. So um, I, I think that there's probably, um, there's kind of about six or seven key um, questions or key kind of bits of advice I'll run through. And um, 
I, I've shot you through this, so feel free to send it out after the after the call, after the webinar. So, but number one, I would say always focus on the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so, what's what's the need that the business has? You know, that could be I need to be able to more efficiently communicate with my clients in a customized form, um, or it could be. I want to be able to speed up client onboarding or I want to be able to reduce the amount of time that it takes to complete fact finds or whatever that kind of priority area of need is both now and into the future. Um, because one of the easiest things to do in the space of tech is, and you know, and because tech companies um, try to do this is, you know, including Sweetbox is, you get you can so easily get caught up looking at all of the shiny product features and for, and lose track of where it's relevant in the business so mm. you always use that um that problem or that need as the guide to what um what you're looking at the second one is look look for the provider to be able to provide you some other references or referees as to who else is using the product and that doesn't need to be very complicated you know you just want to be able to check that actually there's someone else that you can see or talk to that's um and that's leveraging the technology the third one is i would always look behind the company and see who the people are that are involved with the company. Um, so this is, you know, in a sense, a bit more relevant, obviously, where the company is smaller. Um, but, you know, so much of FinTech is small companies, is startups. Um, so, you know, who are the founders? Who are the executive team? Um, who's on the board of the company? And, you know, broadly, I would say, the more that you can see some depth of expertise and people with reputation there somewhere, um, you're de-risking um, to some extent the possibility that the company may not survive. Mm. Um, number four, what's the service and support model? Um, so when you need help, how are you going to get it? Is it you know, only an email address that you know, you're going to be dependent on someone responding to? Or is there you know, a 1-800 number that you can phone in Australia? So you know, at the end of the day, unless the technology is just so easy, that you're never going to need help, which is not usually the case. <laughs> you want to be able to get that help quickly. Number five, what's training is offered? So how do you get up to speed with the with the tech, and how do you keep up to speed with the tech? Um, number six, ask the question: Where's the data held, and how do you retrieve it if you move away from that provider? Um, and important if you cancel your subscription. So, you know, the vast majority, if not all of FinTech innovation is being built on, on the cloud. You may very well leverage a bit of technology for a period of time, cancel at some point in the future, but you're gonna need to know how to get your information back because it's, you know, the information belongs to you as a business, not to the, to the tech provider. Mm. Um, and the last one um, that I would, um, highlight is how easily can the technology be integrated um, or come integrated with other parts of your business workflow? Because what you don't really want to do is end up with big complicated technology projects that most small businesses aren't equipped well to run, trying to get information and data flowing between different technologies that you use. Yeah, we <clears throat> we talked about this the other day that um, for me as a small business, I, I love the idea of being able to pull in and out technology. Um, and so for, for me, that's one of the, the um, high importance is being able to plug into other software that I'm currently using. And just for everyone who's watching, Ian's kindly um, written up those seven points um, for us. So we will kind of email that out to you. Um, and he's got his, his beautiful sweet box branding, which I love. Um, I've, I've seen Naomi sell in the chat box. Ian selling sweet box. <laughs> right. Loving it. Um, out of those seven things that you've just talked about, um, it, if we could rank uh, like one or two things as kind of the most important, um, what do you find the most important? Um, 
I would say the most important is how do you how do you learn how to use the technology and how do you get support from that technology if you need to be able to do something so yeah. I'll just take an example. You deploy a cloud-based CRM system that you're primarily going to be using to manage um, client leads and contacts and kind of content-led marketing. And sometimes that can be complicated and you want to know that you're actually going to be able to, you know, get hold of them, attend webinars, find answers quite easily. Um, because in my view, where you don't really want to end up is going, okay, now I'm going to have to go and pay an industry consultant really to just help you um, get the best of that technology at that kind of slightly kind of more entry level. Mm. Yeah, great. Um, so the next thing is, what are the three top uh, either fintech tools or engagement tools um, that you're liking at the moment that you think is ready to go for advisors to maybe look at using other than Sweetbox? Because I know that's number one, of course. <laughs> I just hold a little sign up going yeah, Sweetbox. That's right. <laughs> um, so, so I think that there is um, the two areas that I think that are now maturing really quickly in Australia and I think are, are going to become really interesting for people people to use um, and, and what and one of them is going to depend a little bit on the business model of, of the advisor um, but there's lots of really great innovation around account opening and onboarding and the capturing of client information so um, all of that space that is involves a lot of manual process um, there's some great technology that's out there right now. So, for example, um, I would encourage people that particularly are doing a lot of stuff in the SMSF space, um, where SMSF, account opening, and deeds, and all that sort of stuff are part of the business. Um, go and have a look at um, Lab Group. So, Lab Group, as far as I'm aware, are the only player in Australia that have actually automated account opening all the way through the process for a self-managed super fund, um, you know, including verification of the um, of the deed information. So I think that that's pretty exciting. Uh, by the way, all these ones I mentioned, I have no conflicted involvement yeah. in, so <laughs> you can shoot me later if you don't like it. Yeah, that's um, right, yeah. yeah. The other, the other, so account opening and that verification KYC, again, depends on the business model, right? Um, the second one I would really encourage the second space I would really encourage um, people to have a good hard look at is um, have a look at my prosperity um, and some of the similar products in the market but the reason I really like my prosperity um, is my prosperity is doing the aggregation of the, um, the account information um, they are really importantly taking the value of that beyond um, budgeting, so hopefully no one for money brilliant or money stop <laughs> watching. But in my view, if you just go to budgeting, you lose the point. Most people don't like budgeting tools. You have to deliver value. Um, and really importantly, so my prosperity, they now have $10 billion of assets being tracked, one and a half billion dollars of liabilities. Um, and they're now working on some open architecture integration to various um, platforms so that you can actually use that data and then start to link it straight through into your client's portfolio. So definitely have a look at them. Um, and then the third space is um, there is some great tools coming out um, around um, portfolio management and portfolio construction if that's a space that you operate um, your business in. And the one I really like there um, is Fincast. So it's going to um, appeal more to businesses that want to manage more of that portfolio construction, um, but, um, you know, some great tools there around portfolio management. No, that, that's fantastic. Um, Fincast, I, I haven't heard of two of those, so it's always good to kind of, I, I always like keeping my eye on what's going on, so uh, it's great kind of hearing two tools that I haven't heard of. Um, so the last question from me before I kind of throw it over to Adrian, 
Um, what, what are some things, um, one or two or three things that uh, advisors can kind of walk away and uh, implement today or in the next week or in the next month that you think is, is important for their business? Um, I would say, I'm not necessarily going to pick a piece of technology, um, but I think that the most one, one of the really practical areas out there right now is, um, is how you're managing your um, CRM and how you're managing your leads and your client contacts. And there's some really great technologies that are developing in that space. I'm not sure I necessarily know which ones are the best, but if you look at Practify, they've done some great stuff on the top of Salesforce. Um, Advisor Intelligence, I know has been a bit delayed, but they've built up CRM on the top of Sugar. Um, you know, Midwinter's bringing out a lot more capability in that space. And, and I think that that whole area really practically is a space um, that can um, really make a big difference to businesses around client contact and client communication. Mm. If there's anyone out there that is not, you know, not emailing your clients, knowing exactly who's opened the emails, knowing what pages on your website that they went to, having all of that analysis, um, you can implement all of that really quickly. Yeah, awesome. All right, over to you, AP. Okay, good stuff so far, and this has been awesome. The um, There's been a few questions that have come through, and uh, I, I really like uh, the one that came from Cassandra McKay around um, the London fintech market. And she's, she's alluding to the similarities between the, um, the regulation uh, between Australia and um, the UK and how that's affecting uh, fintech maybe I'm presuming she's talking about uh, fintech coming over from London or England to Australia and, and what that looks like. Hey Cassandra, how are you? Um, that's a seriously complicated question for, for the morning. Um, so, um, so I, yeah, so I've actually just got back from London. I've been to London three times this year, so racking up the um, cheap frequent flyer miles on China Southern, being a fintech company. Um, I think in the UK, probably the regulatory system is is probably, it's broadly similar to Australia's. Um, as, as some people might be aware, they went through the whole equivalent of our FOFA a couple of years earlier, which was called RDR, or Retail Distribution Review. Um, it actually was a much tougher outcome, regulatory speaking. Um, but what's really interesting in the UK is that the government has taken, the UK government has taken a very, very proactive approach to, to encouraging fintech. Um, so they really led the space in what we tend to call now the regulatory sandbox, um, which has been consulted on by ASIC here. That's the concept that actually in a controlled way, you can go out and develop a product and test it on a little subsection of the market without necessarily being subject to all of the regulatory environment right from you know, pre-launch. Um, and the second thing there is that the government's been really proactive in things like um, approving um, um, you know, various new types of um, investment and lending products into their kind of what they call their ISO individual savings account environment. So that's really spawned a lot of really rapid um, innovation um, in those areas. Great, great. And do you see uh, many things coming over? Like I know there's things coming over from the US, but do you see many, uh, have you seen anything that you would, you could see coming to Australia or are we um, on the same level? Do you know what? I think that, bro I think generally we're on the same page. So, um, in a different in a different space, um, we've seen um, we've seen transfer wise from the UK come here, which is one of the FX providers um, competing with the likes of OFX. Mm. So, if anyone's in the niche space of dealing with foreign currency or multi currency with your clients, make sure you look at an OFX or a transfer wise. You save an absolute fortune on FX transfers, um, like Absolutely. an absolute fortune. Um, so that. That's a big space. Beyond that, though, they're kind of robo space and they're kind of peer to peer lending and that sort of stuff. It's really similar. Yeah, great. Well, I think we're losing you, Ian. 
I'm wondering, is this me or is this me? <laughs> no, Ian's just talked about robo advice, so he's turned into a robot for a second. <laughs> um, you back Have we got you there, Ian? <laughs> oh, am I back? Yeah, 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 you're good. I think well, we'll use that as a bit of a segue, I guess, into the US. I know there's a lot of talk about the US. Naomi's brought it up again. Um, what, in, in a summary, what are they doing that we're not doing and what are we doing that they're not doing? Um, I think that the... So what are we doing that they're not doing is we are doing... We are putting more investment into what I would call more complicated automated advice than what they do. So, you know, even the big players, they're like a Wealthfront Betterment or actually Vanguard personal advisor. At the end of the day, it is all about investment advice. They don't deal with insurance. They don't have to deal with, um, you know, transition to retirement and all that sort of stuff. Whereas you're definitely seeing innovation in Australia that is automating and bringing algorithms into more complex advice. Um, yeah. so for example, there's a product, there's a company launching next week called Plenty, P-L-E-N-T-Y. Um, and, you know, they've done a lot of work around a more comprehensive advice delivered online. So that's what we're doing that they're, that they're not doing. Um, in a different space, what is a huge area in the US and in the UK, which has really not come to Australia materially yet, um, is it's um, biometrics or that space. So really advanced um, uh, around, you know, um, retina or voice and all that sort of thing. So, Ian, we just, we just lost you for a little bit there. So is that just um, around the security and, like, uh, ice, like um, verifying people through their eyes and, and things like that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, sorry, I've just switched my um, Wi-Fi connection. So around um, uh, identity verification, particularly yep. voice, eye, facial recognition, mm. um, that's a really, really big space in the US and in the UK. Yeah, cool. Yeah, well, it's, I think it's it's something that, I don't know if Australia's, uh, I, know, I know there has been situations where data's been taken off advisors, but... Um, maybe we're not on the radar as much as um, we could be, which is, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be getting prepared to um, get things in shape a bit better than it, than it is. The, I guess the, the other thing um, I'm, I'm curious about, actually, sorry, before, before I go into that, uh, Shane, Shane sort of alluded to integrations and I'll, I'll, I'll um, package all these questions up into integrations and API is, is a magical thing that is allowing all the, um, it's the interface between all the different product providers, Sweetbot's integrating into Midwinter. Um, if you want to get uh, Zapier, which, which uh, people may know or not know, um, it, it's what links all the different uh, software solutions together. And I think it's pretty clear now that you can't run your business with one single provider. So API integration is very fundamental to the modern um, advice business. What are, you, what are you seeing in that space in uh, are providers being able to integrate a lot easier these days? Is there a lot more integration happening? Is it speeding up? Are we going to see, um, I guess, what, what does that look like um, going forward in the next yeah, few months? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, yeah, so API, which stands for Application Programming Interface. But do you know what? I just think of it, think of it like the plug that the data electricity flows through between different systems. Um, and you know, already now and more and more in the future, it's it's going to be all about simple um, integration points between complementary technologies in an ecosystem. Now, for most people on this call, I would actually say you don't really want to have to deal with APIs. What you just want to know is I want to use, you know, product A, technology A, and I've also got technology B, and I want to know that there's a, a, a configurable setting or a setup component there that says, I want data to go from A to B. You know, I want to be able to get from um, my CRM to SurveyMonkey, and I don't want to have to move the data myself. I just want it to flow. Um, mm. 
So, um, yes, yeah, so I can see Shane saying there's no such thing as simple integration. And that is so true, right? So, so if you actually find yourselves in that world where you're going, okay, I've got to start working out how this integration actually works, then actually you're kind of going into the space that you don't want to have to um, have to be in. You want to have your different tech providers deliver that integration capability to you. Well, I'll just, I'll just uh, post in uh, Z- Zapier or Zapier. I don't know how it's pronounced properly. Yeah. But that's, I, I look at Zapier as God and uh, because it can integrate with everything. Um, I, I'm going to summarize. Uh, we had a question there from Glenn as well. And what I'll summarize that question as to save you from uh, getting yourself into trouble in the industry and, um, is if you don't integrate, uh, will you die going forward in the current technology? Just about to get myself in trouble in the industry. Um, <laughs> in my view, <laughs> in my view, um, in the end, if you don't integrate, you will die. But this can take a really long time. <laughs> so, <laughs> because there are big vertically integrated technologies that you know that will dominate for a long time but in the end you need to be able to bring together best of breed you know you don't always want to have your your mail tool and your crm and your advice technology and your you know social media tracking or whatever you want to know that you're using the best and you don't want to end up with big kind of you know vertically integrated stack that's hard to um you know optimize but it, these things take time. It's not like that's going to be the case in the next couple of years, but it will, will, it will go that way. So I'll take that as a yes. Thanks, Ian. Uh, <laughs> I'm now just in trouble with all of those vertical integrations. <laughs> um, no, I agree. Things <laughs> take time. It's, it's, the user's advisors, are, not everyone's moving quickly. So um, things will continue as they are and until Correct. people do move. Uh, one thing that I'm really curious about, and this is my personal question around, has B2B, a B2C failed in terms of the automated advice space? And is the future only through B2B or are there players actually finally nailing it? I, I know you've got Acorns out there. That's probably a good example of B2C. Um, yeah. but if you look at the US and Australia in terms of B2, B2C, it's, it's been a struggle. Um, yeah, so great question. Um, you would probably broadly say that the US evidence is that new entrant B2C has, has predominantly failed. And they, you, you might, people might disagree with that, but the reason I say that is the majority of the automated advice providers in the US have actually ended up being sold to incumbent financial services companies that have distribution. The big winner, of B2C distribution of automated advice in the US is Vanguard, right? They are something like already 20 times bigger than their closest competitor. Um, and, um, and, and it all comes down to the fact that they already have distribution. Acquiring, acquiring direct consumers is expensive. And that's why so many new entrants B2C um, organizations really struggle because they don't have the pockets to compete with the majors to win distribution. So is, are you, I guess, alluding to the marketing spend required, whether you're using social media, whatever channels you're going down, it's expensive to... It's expensive, yeah. It's expensive and and the major players and the major brands will will always have the opportunity to massively outspend um, new entrants. So, so that's why the, the, the B2C is a challenging space that some people will succeed in. But, you know, if I look in Australia, right, you've probably got 10, 12 automated advice providers, you know, n- new entrants, none of them have got particularly deep pockets to compete in marketing spend. How are they all going to compete ultimately with the majors when they get their, um, you know, when they kind of, get their get their position straight mm. yeah i guess that's that's a really good um point around the this expenditure in australia and in terms of the big four so to speak or big five or six uh depending on how you put it um are they going to become obviously they're trying to um roll out things that are going to continue to capture their already um captured market and, and keep them in 
in house, are they going to be rolling things out that are going to be, I guess, more open architecture? Are they going to be forced to do that over time because they have invested in these great, um, these great systems? They've got the biggest pockets. Are we going to? Would will the IFA market say? Will the more independently uh, minded advisor see this uh, come from the the big end of town to the smaller end of town? Or um, look, you, you're definitely going to see the big end of town innovate and mimic and potentially buy. Um, and you know, and we're already seeing that right with Macquarie and with you know some stuff that um, you know NAB's rolled out, etc. So you, you know that will definitely occur. It could be could be a purchase strategy, or it could be a replication strategy, or an in-house strategy. Um, whether they become very open architecture, um, I'll have to wait and see. To be honest, it's in my view, it's not generally in the DNA of large corporates to be particularly open architecture. Um, uh, you know, having said that, you know Macquarie's robo product is you know, somewhat open architecture. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting w w wait and see to see what happens in that space. Cool. Okay. Well, um, everyone, there's still still a bit of time for questions. Phil, Phil's probably going to jump in with a couple of things on his mind, uh, I think. But um, if anyone's got any other questions, just jump them in, uh, throw them in the, the chat box there. And Ian's been, uh, been able to feel them like a champ, so I'm sure I can deal with a few more. Yeah, Ian, let's um, let's answer a few of Shane. Shane's kind of allowing you to do a product flog, uh, and Adrian's <laughs> been blocking him like a champ. Um, so I will I will ask really quick answers. Uh, is Sweetbox ever going to go from a one to one meeting to one to many? Maybe not a, a webinar style, but maybe like a bring your financial advisor, your accountant, your lawyer in the one meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. I did not <laughs> answer these questions. Um, the answer is yes, and it gets released in two weeks. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and are you looking at integrating with the X plans of the world? I'm sure you'd love to, but, but how far are we there? Um, the answer is yes. Um, we're integrating into X plans 2.1 version, 2.21, I should say. Um, <laughs> but it will actually come out in two phases. So the first phase will come out at the end of December um, and the second phase will come out in Q1 next year. Perfect. And if, if you, sorry, if anyone's, <laughs> sorry, say that again. Sorry, Naomi. <laughs> if, if, um, if anyone's got any more questions about Sweetbox, um, Ian will put in his mobile phone number, give him a call, um, and, and if you've got any questions, just hit him up. I know Ian's more than happy to, to take a phone call um, to answer any questions you have. So um, that's probably enough of the product vlogs. Um, <laughs> uh, so thanks, Shane. I'm sure Ian kind of hit you up beforehand to say, throw some <laughs> questions out. Hey, Shane's an advisor. He's got to make some money somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So I just, I just want to say thanks, Ian, for coming on board. It's, it's been a great session uh, talking about uh, what the future of advice may look like um, and, and how we're going to bring in some tools to help us do what we're doing and, and maybe take away the kind of uh, more cumbersome tasks and, and the high cost tasks, really, uh, and we can maybe use robots um, to take over those. Um, Bill, I'm just going gonna, gonna to jump in there just because... There's a really good point that's been, because we still do have a little bit of time, and there's a really good point that Mark's brought up. And I think it's about electronic signatures in general. I saw something come out um, the other day about um, some legal actions are starting to occur around that space. And um, because it's only it's only been the last, last within the last year that's really starting to make, make it to the mainstream. A lot of the product providers are starting to allow uh, electronic signatures. Um, I know you guys have electronic signing inside um, uh, Sweetbox, which with, when captured by video, it's pretty powerful in court. Um, do you see, is there issues with just, um, for example, DocuSign where you're just sending it off on email, they're, they're printing it in, you're getting all the timestamps, you've got the email uh, correspondence. A lot of people are probably, because um, you're getting mixed messages from different uh, providers, uh, different licensees around how legal things are. Would you be able to give some clarity to the community out there around that space? Yeah, let, let me try the. It, it's, 
I'll try the short version, right? So, so, so broadly, think so. So, Australia has a as a regulatory environment under the Electronic Transactions Act that is accommodative of electronic and digital signatures. Um, there are some exceptions, and broadly, the exceptions apply to things like wills, estates, powers of attorney, that type of stuff. You know, think of that as the type of documents that you would normally have gone into um, your lawyer or attorney and had witnessed and that sort of stuff. They are generally not able to be signed um, digitally or electronically. The big real change of acceptance and behaviour in the market comes from the product manufacturers themselves. So, so the law accommodates it, what we've got to do is get the product manufacturers accepting it. And that's moving quite quickly. And we're trying to do that. DocuSign is actually our best friend because they do it, you know, in advance of us. Um, but we are starting to see that change. And I think it's going to change really quickly over the next couple of years. Yeah, cool. Thank, thank you for that. Eh? I'll, I'll let, let Phil uh, continue with the, uh, the wrap up. Sorry for inter um, interrupting. No, that's perfect. Uh, it was actually Mark who interrupted with a late question. I, we were uh, <laughs> getting in some, some late last minute questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, guys, thanks heaps for joining us. Thanks, Ian and Adrian. Um, it was a great session. Uh, we record these sessions and put them up on YouTube uh, and we send them out on our mailing list. So make sure you're on the mailing list. Um, and so you can hear about what we're doing next four nights time. We actually have uh, Nikhil who founded Pro Advisor, uh, which was an, a robo advice product uh, that's no longer in the market. So he founded it, started it up and then had to close it down. So that'd be a great session kind of following on from this, um, talking about the fintech space and the robo space and, and how uh, a company may not um, survive um, to, to he's really... He's a great guy, by the way. So. You should, yeah, he's a great guy. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so we've got him on. Um, I've just put the link in there, so make sure you register. Um, so thank you again, and thanks, everyone, for coming in, and we'll see you guys next fortnight's time. See ya. Thanks, guys. See you later. Thanks, Ian.